Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland. I'm going to tell you another true crime story. Listen. A man writing. Listen closely because it's a quiet sound, an intimate sound. The year is 1795, and the man who is doing this quiet, intimate thing is named Peter Drute. He is writing his will, making with goose quill and parchment his bequest to his children. When he is done, unknowingly, he will have made certain the death of his two sons. And now he is done. Now he has made certain. And tonight, my report to you on the Axe and the Drute family, how they fared. Crime Classics, a series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Thomas Highland. The place is Heidelberg Township, Dauphin County in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. During the closing years of the 18th century, Heidelberg snuggled against a bend of the Susquehanna. Its chief product was people who were sent downstream to Harrisburg and overland to Philadelphia. So great was the margin of export over import that I can no longer locate Heidelberg Township on a very good map of Pennsylvania. However, During the time that it flourished, it was noted chiefly for its rocks, which were used all over the county to build churches, sheds, barns, and gravestones. The Drute family lived in a stone house, and Peter Drute was so wealthy that he was buried in a coffin imported from Bavaria, which was decorated with cherubs painted on porcelain and other sad scenes. His shroud was of genuine black Westphalian lace. His lawyer was of 100% Saxony stock and came from Philadelphia. And to my daughter Elizabeth, I, Peter Drew, do will and bequeath the sum of 1,000 pounds. However, the sums I have already advanced to her in the amount of 800 pounds shall be considered a part of this legacy. And to my sons, Francis and Peter, I leave the residue of my estate. But in the event of the death of either of my sons, without issue... And his daughter Elizabeth, pure product of Heidelberg Township, was moved. Some father, some father I had, to leave to his own true daughter a measly 200 pounds. You have done a deception to me. Deception how? To tell me you were the favorite of the old man's children and would inherit the money. This is deception, to get me to be the husband of you. John. What? I did not mean to deceive you. Get thee away. I begged you to believe me. Get thee from the chair and take my hand. The likes of you are spouse to the likes of me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said it, Elizabeth. Get thee away. That vile man, that father to me, to have done this to his daughter, that I have to wait until the death of my brothers to get to his wealth. That I have to wait until the death of my brothers to get to his wealth. That I have to wait until the death of my brother. Yes, yes, I heard it. And that as each one of them would die, I would get 500 pounds. Yes, yes, I heard it. Elizabeth. What, husband? How well do you love your brothers? Francis is the oldest, and I can recall one day at the quarry when he struck me with a stone, this scar. And the younger one, Peter. Who was named for my father, and as cruel as my father, and who became my father's favorite in my stead, who once called me a name I shall never forget. Were they to die? I am sister to them. I should weep in your arms, husband, and you would make me smile again. Smile now. In your arm? Yes. J. 
John and Elizabeth Hauer, Pennsylvanian lovers. He, a stonemason who had more epitaphs at the tip of his chisel than any stonemason in the county. She, noted for her scar and her elderberry jelly. The old man just growing chill in his coffin from Bavaria. And John and Elizabeth, daughter and son-in-law, were getting ready to lay the rest of the family beside him. I think we should start with the younger one first. Why, whatever are you talking about? He's better off dead than alive, anyhow. Why, whatever are you talking about? <laughs> Put me down. Put me down. John put Elizabeth down and got on his horse. He rode to Harrisburg at a clip which can only be described as uh, furious. Now in Harrisburg, there lived a friend of his, an elderly gentleman who distilled things and bottled them. It is said that this gentleman could do a thing with toadstools and snake venom that you wouldn't believe. The gentleman, whose name is recorded in state annals as Uncle Hess der Kleine, was finally ducked in a pond for 12 minutes by the authorities. Well, John bought a few ounces of an essence from Uncle Hess and rode back to Heidelberg Township. And the next day, in the stone quarry, this is what happened. And how is your brother Francis these days, Peter, lad? I don't see much of him these days. He's busy counting his money, I suppose, and yours. He is a farmer. He farms. A uh, question, lad. I, John? Have you had the fancies lately? How do you know about that? Your sister, lad. She told me. How since a lad you have been seeing strangies and ghosties and whatnot. And what of it? Nothing, lad. Nothing. It is true that I have been visited. And me, too. And last week I was lying beneath the stars near the barn. And there was a wailing. And I look about me. Such a beautiful fancy she was. And she was crying. Go on. Go on, John. Of such beauty. And I reached out my hands to her. And her image was smoke. Wondrous. I can see her any time I wish it. How? I have a thing here, a potion, a small bottle of it, prepared specially to lie under the stars to see this wondrous, beautiful lady. Was she indeed so beautiful? I am unschooled. I have not the words for her beauty. Please. What, lad? Give me of that vial. Let me taste. She stirs your imagination, lad. Yes, oh, yes. You can almost see her in your mind now, can you not? Even while you talk, I try to imagine her. Please, give me of the vial. Here, drink it. Yes. All of it. <laughs> Good lad. Tonight, lie down under the stars and see what will happen to you. Thank you, John. The bottle is good no longer. Throw it away, lad. Eighteen years old and given to fancies. Now, all of us know that many lads of 18, even today, are given to fancies. But young Peter Drute was very rich and lived in Pennsylvania. And it was a rare moment indeed when he wasn't beginning or ending a fancy. And two, this, we must remember, was the era of potions to conjure up most anything, from rain to a lady made of smoke. So, young Peter Drute had everything going for him that night, youth, imagination, and potion. He went out under the stars and lay down near the barn, just like his brother-in-law told him to do. What happened then may be described as a good night in the country gone to waste. Oh! Oh, my stomach! Oh! My stomach! My stomach! My stomach! Oh! Oh! Oh. That rooster crowing really upset schedules in old Heidelberg Township that night. 
people and animals looked out of the window and wondered what ailed that rooster anyhow. It was too early to get out of bed and too late to go back to sleep, so they gave ear to the commotion. Through the din rose the wails of Peter Droop, who had seen no fancies but was writhing with a terrible ache in his stomach. His brother Francis brought him back to the house and applied an old Pennsylvania poultice, which relieved the lad no end. So, the next morning in the stone quarry... And all that happened, John, was an ache right here. A grievous ache. Poor lad. Lad. Yes? When you lay yourself down under the stars, which way were you facing? Toward the east. Toward Bruder Gansel's farm. I... I should have told you. I did it wrong. Oh, it is my fault. You faced the wrong way. Uh, however... Come here. Uh, walk with me. Uh, sit yourself down here by this pile of rocks. Here? Uh, to your left a wee bit. Very good. Now close your eyes and think hard. Of what? Of beautiful things. And silently I will say a magical thing. And I will go from you a little and behind you. Peter, keep closed your eyes. Say it. Say the magical thing. Aye, right now. Men, all of you, the lad Peter Droot is buried beneath the rocks. He is dead. No, no, I am not. The slide of rocks did not touch me. I heard their sound and I leaped and I... What a relief it is to me. Oh, how happy I am. But why have we come here, John? To the loft of the barn? I have another way to show you the fancy. How? This rope I have here tied to the rafter. Place it about your neck. Very well. Do not let me fall, for the rope is not long enough to reach the floor. Is the rope tight enough about your neck now, lad? Tight enough? For what? For this! <laughs> John? The rope broke, John. Please don't be frightened. I'm not hurt. I'm not hurt at all. And as long as Peter stayed alive, John couldn't collect any of the legacy, which is why John sat in a hayloft, head in hand, and pondered. Then John thought about an axe. And he pondered no more. You are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. Patrolman Kirk reported in from Box 23 at 142 on time to the minute. His next call was to come from Post 7. He never made it. When they finally found him, he had been shot to death. Was it suicide or murder? The steady, detailed work the real police do will again be evident on CBS Radio's 21st Precinct tomorrow evening as the world's largest police force tackles The Case of Patrolman Kirk and Post 7. 21st Precinct is broadcast on most of these same stations. Be at Post 7 tomorrow. And now once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on the Axe and the Droot family, how they fared.
A few notes about Pennsylvania as it neared the end of the 18th century. It was already a state to be reckoned with. General Washington had camped there during the winter of 1777-78 at a place known as Valley Forge. In the town of Chester, Mad Anthony Wayne drilled his troops in an unusual manner in the courthouse square. The western part of the state was rife with forests, game, trout streams, and beneath it, the silent flow of oil to be discovered 50 years later in Titusville of all places. A dominion of wealth discovered and as yet undiscovered, of history made and as yet unmade. To prove my point, a person by the name of Barbara Fritchie, who was born in old Heidelberg Township, had not quite yet been born. But across the street from the house where Barbara would first see the light of day, where her grubby little fingers would reach for her first needle, across the street lived John and Elizabeth Hower, man and wife. As is our prerogative, let's look in on them. The rope broke. What a pity. It seems I can't kill him. Something always goes wrong. You always were a hasty man, ruined things. In the barn this morning, I did everything neatly. The rope broke. It was a new rope. And both of my brothers still live. I thought of something. And both of my brothers still live. And both of my brothers still live. Would you listen, spouse? I? I thought of an axe. And what did you think of an axe? How it can smash things. What things? Tables. And cups? Chairs. And chicken? And skulls. And skulls. And husband? What? Will you do it? It will be done. By whom? Ah. By you? By a man I know and his friend. And after it's done, what shall I have? You will have no brothers. And in their stead? Money. Husband. Yes? Lift me. Lift me. Spin me around. What is it? To talk with you, Charles. Come in, man. To talk with me? Aye. Where's your friend, Patrick? There's uh, the talk money in it. Aye. Before or after the key? A little before and much after. <laughs> Patrick. We... Wick, Wick, Patrick. There's money in it. John Hall. Aye. Come into here. Good evening to you, Patrick. Uh -huh. Now, John Hall, speak to the both of us. My wife's brothers are alive. If they were to die, my dear wife would receive all of their money. And uh, is this the end of it? A very great sum of money. And? And this axe I have brought... It cuts deep. Aye. Well, Patrick? Uh-huh. Well, John Howell? Wait. It is enough. Uh, for now. Patrick... Get out of bed, man. There were frontiers in those days. As a matter of fact, our country was more frontier than anything else. And the people, those who survived, were the fittest. I would like to describe two fit people of the time. Charles McManus. Which is my name. I am 42 years old. 
I stand six inches above five feet, and my weight is close to 200 pounds. Once in Killarney, I killed a man with my fists. I fled to America. In New York, I killed again with my fist. I fled to the backwoods of Pennsylvania. Patrick Donegan. That's me. I'm much too slight to kill with my fist. I must have steel in my hand. There was a woman in Donegal County. Her death brought me here, where I am now. Very fit persons indeed. Killers. And attuned to the wilderness. They moved quietly. There, he said. Uh, Hold him, Patrick. And uh, the young one sleeps in there, he said. Hold him, Patrick. Are you a fancy? Now we can go. the dancing. Come to me. Come to me. Uh, They are dead. They are dead. Outside the night is warm. And there is moon. And there will be us. Gently. In a moment. John, hold me. They came, the townspeople, and they knocked on the door of John Hower and his wife Elizabeth. And they brought him and his wife to the house where Peter and Francis Droop were lying. Elizabeth fell down upon the floor and wept bitterly. John sat down and made no remark. And this is the tableau, one hour after the murder had been committed. And the townspeople had found that nothing had been plundered from the house. And the townspeople knew that only John and Elizabeth would profit from the death of the brothers. And an axe had been found. And the townsmen knew it to be the axe of John Hower. Then John Hower made a remark. I did not do it. Then they asked him who did do it. Two murderers. Two, they asked him. How do you know it was two, John? I hired them. Hi, what is it? John, our it is, Charles. Open. Hey, who are all these people? What people have you brought with you? The man holding the torch there is Ebner. By his side and holding another torch is George. And the next to him, neighbors and neighbors and neighbors. They have come after you and after Patrick. For what? For what you have done. For what? For the murder of the brothers of my wife. You hired us, John. I told them that. Patrick, wake up. (laughs) 
In June 1798, a trial was made charging the three men and Elizabeth Hower with murder. I have never been one whose life has been governed by the lust for money. Only love and sweet solicitude for my husband. If it has been my husband's immodesty to have committed murder, I do love him still. I committed no murder. He committed no murder, he says. He gave me an axe. He gave me money. I returned them and said, do your dirty work yourself. Didn't I, Patrick? As sure as you're born. I heard you refuse the man distinct, and I heard him muttering that he'd do it himself. Gentlemen of the jury, as your judge, I now charge you. The murder of Peter and Francis Droot rouses the indignation of the county. Its atrocity is unequaled by anything of the kind hitherto known in Pennsylvania. The execution of the murders was as horrid as the motives were base and grovelly. The keenest sensations must arise in the minds of all good men and worthy citizens. The judge then went into particular detail of all the evidence that had been given and committed the case to the jury at four o'clock on Sunday afternoon. At seven o'clock in the evening, they returned a verdict. John Hower, guilty. Charles McManus, guilty. Patrick Donegan, guilty. Elizabeth Hower, not guilty. I'm pleased. I'm so pleased. Goodbye, my husband. The guilty were all of them hanged on Saturday, July 14th, 1798. Elizabeth Hower mourned for a respectable interval, then married again to one Obed Fanestock. The Fanestocks moved to Maryland, to the growing community of Cumberland, where they bought a house and a well and sold water to settlers moving west. And it all happened in old Heidelberg Township which I can no longer find on the map. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. The Droot family, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrow. In tonight's story, Mary Jane Croft was heard as Elizabeth, and Clayton Post as John. Featured in the cast were Herb Butterfield, Sam Edwards, Paul Fries, and Charles Davis. George Walsh speaking. And here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, San Francisco Bay, midway between Oakland and San Francisco, on board the good ferry El Capitan. The year is 1870, and the events are catastrophic, as I report to you on the incredible trial of Laura D. Fair. Thank you. Good night. Academy Award winner Joan Fontaine will be your star in Leave Her to Heaven on Lux Summer Theater on CBS Radio later tonight. You'll enjoy this celebrated story of a ruthless woman who destroys the things she loves. And you like Joan Fontaine in this dramatic role. That's Leave Her to Heaven starring Joan Fontaine later tonight on the Lux Summer Theater show on most of these same stations. And remember, Bill Cullen's Walk a Mile show is heard Monday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>